We're live. All right, I'm told that we are live on our first ever 565 live stream. Uh, so first, thanks to Mariano and Yusuf for setting up our first live stream. I know we have a lot of alumni and our friends in industry watching our presentations today. Uh, but before we jump into it, I just want to say uh, a few things. Uh, so in every year, 565, we've been pushing the limits with the final projects. And everyone knows I get nervous because they're so good. I'm like, well, how are we going to top this next year? right? But this year, we pushed some very impressive boundaries. Here are some stats. We have 19 final projects, seven of which are using Vulcan. That's a pretty, pretty impressive number, uh, three of which are Another three are making contributions to open source, whether it be Babylon or Cesium. And a big thank you to the Babylon team at Microsoft and Sebastian uh, and David for mentoring and also Gary, Cesium fame and former 565 TA fame. Um, three of our 19 projects are using WebGL and another five are using CUDA. Uh, and that leaves one project, which is our first ever project using Metal. So pushing some new boundaries here. Uh, and there's one project that is also a complete custom VR pipeline that I heard we're going to see demoed live. I think they're still working on it over there. Um, and then when you look at the, the topics, you know, they span graphics, everything from clouds uh, to weather to terrain uh, to forest. And on the compute, it could be localization, uh, it could be object avoidance, object detection. Uh, so a lot of good stuff coming up here. Then a lot of thanks, too. So we've had guest speakers. We've had... Alumni have had a Sean from EA come, Kai from Google came and gave guest lectures here, Sebastian from Microsoft, great guest lecture, Tim from NVIDIA came, uh, Angela and Lars from CBRE, and, ha and uh, Javier as well come and talk about deep learning. So, so I thank all of our speakers. Uh, our student advisors this year, Moody, I hope I didn't embarrass you too much on our Facebook group. So our grass, our Vulcan grass project, all thanks to Moody and then Jen and Josh almost pulled through on the VR project, but we, we believe they are they're about to pull through right now. Uh, and then our TAs, everyone knows I don't I am the, the organizer. I think I'm going to demote myself again next year to like the the duct tape of 565. Uh, but Austin, Otavio, and Kai Sean, they did. I mean, they were you know doing the real work, hands on, deeply appreciated. And then last but not least. On the thank you, Shazan, real deal, CUDA, several years experience, focus on performance, uh, not afraid to go deep and not afraid of performance analysis. So please thanks to all our guest speakers and TAs. <laughs> and then before I turn it over, just some logistics. If you're on deck, please be ready. You know, as the last talk is ending, don't be afraid, just come right on up and we'll set you up immediately. Uh, four minutes, please, if you're going a little over, we'll probably tolerate it. Or if you're going to like six, eight, 10 minutes, you know, it's a little, a little much, so please stay. Four minutes, and not everyone in the room will be familiar with your project, so please do, uh, you know, your best four minute elevator pitch for people who haven't heard of your project before. And with that said, Sarah and Charles are gonna come do the first, first presentation. Great. So, um, so we made a custom BVH for ray tracing metaballs. So yeah, and it's called How You Cancel Metaballs. Um, and I'm really proud of this. So really appreciate it. Um, basically, uh, we'll go over you know kind of like the basics of metaballs and BVH and why it's kind of useful and kind of our whole process and how our uh, project turned out in the end. Well, first, what are metaballs, or also known as blobbies? They're um, an ISO surface. They're um, commonly ring marched which means stepping along a ray, find, looking for intersections, or meshed, um, often using the marching cubes algorithm, but the shortcomings of those are they're both slow. Um, the mesh algorithm kind of depends on how big your boxes are, for how good it looks. Um, so that's the BVH. So. Yeah, so basically BVH, you know, it, it's kind of a very basic graphics uh, tool. The idea is that it takes your scene, whether it be geometry or, or any sort of, you know, kind of memory, and you basically divide it spatially so such that when you uh, try to trace it via array, it's a little bit easier to find. You know, like if you have millions of polygons, you can um, instead of doing you know millions of checks, you then do a smaller amount of checks. Um, 
So what's really beneficial for metaballs is that metaballs are kind of like a spatial structure, as in they affect each other based on their uh, relative position, position to each other. So if they're closer together, they start to melt like this, and a BVH is perfect for that because it allows you to you know, detect neighbors uh, more easily. And so basically what we implemented that's slightly different is um, uh, fitted BVH with split metaballs. Basically the idea of the split, split metaball is that it's a metaball that's not technically a part of a BVH node, but does influence the metaballs in that BVH node. So if you didn't have these split metaballs, using a BVH uh, acceleration on metal, or metaballs would work? Yeah, split basically. So here are some like kind of more kind of technical things that we had to implement to make this whole thing work. So for array marching, we had um, the secant method, which is instead of um, stepping along the array in like um, like along, yeah, you'd have to like kind of smartly go and you can like jump farther along the array to speed things up. Um, so it's just a root finding method that we implemented. Yeah. Uh, we also did a concurrent linked list. Um, which was for each pixel you have, um, you're going to hit a bunch of different metaballs and you need to know like all of them. You can't just take the first one. Um, and so originally we were saving all possible. We had to like allocate memory for as many um, per pixel, but we added a concurrent list so we could kind of pack all that data into the beginning of the data structure. Yeah, and a big kind of like GPU challenge is like, how do you store your memory? Because you, know, you don't have dynamic arrays, you have to like kind of flatten everything out. One of the things that we had to focus on was how do we index or split nodes? Our split metal balls because those are actually duplicate metal balls. So uh, we had to, you know, for each uh, leaf node, give a cap of the total number of split metal balls per leaf node. Uh, and then we all have to kind of figure out, you know, our max number of uh, leaf nodes in a, in a binary tree is, you know, the number of nodes at max depth. But not every uh, leaf node is at max depth. So for example, we would have to index something at this depth down here um, and, you know, try to make sure we um, use as little memory as we, as we possibly can. And finally, one of our optimizations in streams, uh, our construction algorithm for our BVH is actually on the CPU uh, because you know we wanted to take advantage of dynamic arrays. Uh, but luckily, you know we can kind of leverage some CUDA things and uh, basically make the CPU function and the GPU uh, and the GPU function run at the same time, basically hiding our CPU costs. Uh, yeah, here's kind of like what a demo looks like. Uh, basically, what's kind of cool about this is that our BVH is being constructed. We constructed every frame because our, our metaballs are constantly moving. I think this has what like, uh, ten. yeah, like ten thousand metaballs, which is kind of cool. Um, and we just, yeah, I think it looks nice. Uh, finally, we'll just kind of go over a quick performance analysis. We have you know visible evidence of our you know our performance gain sometimes up to like four times, um, and we're kind of showing that there are some parameters that don't necessarily have like you know a one way gain. Like for example, our depth um, increasing the BBH depth may help, but if we increase too much, it may take up more space than is necessary and slow down the overall process. Uh, same with how much how much we allocate uh, for the maximum number of split nodes. Kind of what cool cool things we learned throughout this process. Uh, overall shortcomings, we just kind of realized that like memory management is like a huge problem. So like making sure that we don't take up too much space and slow down our process too much, or even like make our project crash. Uh, we're kind of in these big considerations. Obviously, we wanted uh, more speed up than we got, but I think you know we have things to work with and kind of have learned a lot from this project. Um, yeah, and then there was like a couple of little like um, artifacts with like little pixels that were off that we couldn't figure out why. Like, yeah, there's a lot of tweaking involved with getting a good final image and everything. Yeah, we'll probably go Any questions? Alright, thank you guys. And if there are questions and you're presenting, please repeat the question or summary of the question. And when you present, try not to stand directly in front of the team one side of the So we did a, a WebGL uh, volumetric render based on EA's Frostbite engine, and it's called Heatstroke. So we're going to talk about general pipeline and show the results and some analysis afterwards. So the general pipeline is we pass, we create a shadow map pass, then it goes to the geometry pass, and then 
Plus the volume metric pass, and then we added a bonus tone mapping at the end. And so for shadow mapping, we only implemented it for directional light, so it's really far from the scene, and we render it uh, from the light's perspective, which is this red uh, block here. And, and then so in the volume pass, what we do is very much through the actual volume itself and calculate the lighting for each point. Yes, so um, game engines normally don't um, render complete a scene for volumetric, what they do is they render a smaller texture for the volumetric and then uh, upsample it to make things faster. So we added that. Um, also for tone mapping, um, we have uh, three methods for linear, drain hard, and the one they used for Uncharted 2. Um, so the difference is very much apparent when the lights are really bright especially when there's the density of volume is too high it's just uh, linear is just blown away but the uh, uncharted is very right now so we show a demo for all right so this is the default when you first load it you're going to see have 10 random lights that are just floating through the bundle scene. And you can see this is a heterogeneous medium, so all the density is uh, different. Right? And the user, we added some authoring tools so the user can just be a different volume density as well. And there's another mode called sandbox mode where you can, there's two lights that the user can modify and change the light color, uh, the intensity, where they are in the scene, uh, just to give a Cool. Oh, um, also, users can adjust the volume's position and the texture. So, volume basically uh, is represented as a three D density texture. So, um, you can have you can reposition it and change the way it looks and it all. Yeah. <laughs> And we added some debug issues. Uh, so this is only rendering the shadow. Um, and I believe you can move the, I'll show the direction light moving so you can see the shadows are changing each time. Just the volume. Yep. And some shortcoming up oh, so the performance. Uh, you can see the volume takes up a lot of time, but it's still pretty, pretty fast for all things considered. Yeah, I mean we are re marching. We are having thirty lights, and we are re marching uh, at every frame, and still it's giving us like less than one frame. It is the performance analysis for hundred bits. Uh, so there's Frostbite implemented something with temporal integration, which we didn't get to do. Um, also volumetric shadow mapping. Uh, so we don't need the regular basic shadow mapping for this. So that's something we kind of want to look for. So our, sh our volume doesn't cast shadows. Yeah. Um, it is affected by <laughs> And we haven't deployed it yet. That's a token. Sure. And this is just the progression of that project thing. And we've got. Question? Fantastic. It won't be a project. We have a long history of final projects becoming regular projects. And it's definitely a Hey, hey everyone, so this is my final project, uh, CUDA feature matching and object tracking. 
first i will present the feature matching part so uh, this is the feature matching pipeline it begins with feature detection feature description and feature matching finally the feature detection part uh, i implemented this difference of gaussian method it scales up to nine levels and uh, uses five uh, sigma parameter widths to calculate uh, gaussian differences this is used to uh, detect object like uh, it encompasses object uh, edge detection and hue detection in one pipeline the next step is coming up with the uh, descriptors field uh, for each key point detected and the descriptor field uh, contains the part which uh, you you want to uh, encompass around a key point and uh, I I use brief descriptors because it it is really fast and uh, the binary en uh, encoding is really very fast for uh, pinpointing key maps. The next part is actually the feature matching part. So the binary uh, string which we have uh, which I have uh, calculated from brief descriptors is used to compare uh, these. Uh, Two power n key points, and then those uh, two power n key points uh, are used in a k nearest neighbor algorithm to detect which is the most nearest key point to track the features. So, in doing all this, uh, these are some optimizations which I've used. Uh, I've used dynamic programming. Uh, what dynamic programming does here? It stores the result and avoids the computation uh, many times i've used shared memory then i've used uh, loop unrolling uh, by a factor of 2 and i have also removed bank conflicts and the most uh, i think most optimizable part was uh, balancing thread workload uh, it almost gave a performance boost of almost 10x so that's pretty good and these are some of the charts which uh, I've used. Uh, it uh, shows uh, feature matching on a 720p image. This is the speed up from starting from a serial version using OpenCV's code to finally going till 19x on a 720p image with the previous optimizations. This is a result. As you can see, it is done in real time. Uh, as you can see, some of the points uh, which are coming down there, they are outliers and had to come up with a better outlier detection, but that is a shortcoming. Okay. Yeah. And the second part is object tracking. This is the pipeline for object tracking. So first you draw a box around an object. You use your tracking algorithm to track the object uh, in the box and you keep updating for each frame this is the basic design uh, these are the uh, so the tracking algorithm is uh, called kernelized correlation filters these are the steps in kernelized correlation filters every step includes uh, compressing and decompressing uh, descriptor sets it is basically a machine learning pipeline uh, where you calculate the basic features then you come up with updated features for them uh, using principal component analysis and then you imply you know, apply kernel regression on them to calculate the loss and this is how uh, algorithm follows and these are the optimizations uh, I used CU FFT from NVIDIA then I use shared memory again avoided bank conflicts then I use streams uh, streams was a pretty good implementation and it gave a lot of boost to this algorithm and last thing I use GPU mat instead of mat from OpenCV it, it is really well for uh, using memory optimizations on GPU and this is the benefit and this is the speed up uh, as you can see it scales well up to large videos and as an example this is the
Hi, my name is Megana. And I'm Haman. And we are here to present Meteoros, which is our project that we worked on. Um, it is based on the paper Nubis, uh, which is a volumetric, real-time volumetric cloudscape renderer that was presented in SIGGRAPH, originally in SIGGRAPH 2015 and modified in 2017. Okay, so um, I guess the main motivation behind this paper is how clouds add a lot to a scene. Like, uh, if you look at this picture, you can, uh, without the clouds, it would be a completely different scene. Like, you wouldn't get any of the um, foam out of the image. So, um, first, I'd like to walk us through our basic general, uh, technical approach. And so, I guess one of the key features of this project was that it was built in Vulcan. And because it's built in Vulcan, we spent a majority of our project just uh, dealing with Vulcan and not the actual paper, about two and a half weeks out of four. And it's crazy. It's a lot of verbosity. Yes. Um, when it comes to the actual algorithm, what we're trying to do is uh, remarch clouds. And so for that, you have to create a good uh, remarch setup where we define the earth and then the atmospheric layers. And uh, we place a camera on the surface of the earth and start remarching above the horizon line. And um, every point in the atmosphere can be sampled using 3D texture textures to get a density value. Once you have a density value, you can determine if the point you're sampling is actually a cloud or not. And based on that, you can um, start eroding it away to get more um, defined features. Once you know you're basically in a cloud and you have some density value, you can also remarch through it once again towards the light to start lighting it. And we use cone sampling for that. And this, that's basically an overview of everything we did. So this is just an overview of the lighting portion specifically. Um, the lighting model for this project is broken down into three different probabilities. Uh, directional scattering, absorption and outscatter, and inscattering. And uh, these are all employed into the render. Um, and as Amon was mentioning, when you reach a point inside your cloud, you then shoot rays towards your light, and you ray march towards your light and approximate these probabilities. Um, a couple of post-processing features that we implemented, uh, HDR, tone mapping, and god rays. Um, I guess it's a little hard to see on the TV, but you can see um, this is uh, like from tone mapping, just uh, or that's originally without tone mapping to what it is with tone mapping. And these are the god rays, and you can see them um, shining through into the water. And the other portion to this project is tweaking, 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 and lots of tweaking and magic numbers. Magic numbers really make up a decent portion of this project, so a lot of time goes into doing that. And so we're going to do a live demo. This is what our clouds look like right now with cloud rays. There, um, most of the features are well defined, but it's not running at the best quality and best frame rate. Um, so to fix that, we are also working on uh, reprojection, which basically allows us to um, use the previous frames data to create um, the image for the current frame. But as you can see, it's still buggy, but this is running at uh, 0.6 milliseconds, and that's cool. Um, and so going back to our presentation, um, performance. 
This is a couple of charts that we uh, measure performance with. So one of them is uh, measuring God rays. Uh, and this one is on cheap sampling and early termination. So essentially, um, with rain marching, you only want to start rain marching once you actually hit your volume. And so once you hit the clouds, which we have defined to exist within a certain uh, radius of the atmosphere above the Earth, that's when you start rain marching and also light sampling. And as I mentioned, I was talking about reprojection, and this is about a six times speed up with reprojection. And we were only doing very uh, basic things, so it should be much better uh, when we're doing the full volume. Um, some features we wanted to add in were reprojection, which is in a prototype um, stage, and also temporal anti-aliasing and FXA. And that's it. Thank you. Thank Any you. questions? Great job. All right, hello everyone. We made a visualizer for trying to explore the fourth spatial dimension. Uh, feel free to interrupt the questions at any point. I know this is the first time we've been able to come forward with a lot of these results. Uh, just a brief overview of what we're trying to do here is provide a way to visualize something like this wrapped. If you imagine this uh, cross here wrapped in the 4D, you get this tesseract. It's kind of the analog of having um, a cross-like net folded around to make the cube. And what this is, is this gives us a fourth axis. It's a w-axis that's perpendicular to x, y, and z. And what we really want to do is provide a way to have, you know, give the user actual translation across all four axes, a way to rotate and give them a realistic field of view. So, we accomplished all of our goals. We decided on 8 degrees of freedom instead of 10 because if we were running out of keys on the keyboard and the other two just didn't feel worthwhile. Um, but we got operations, we got the signal geometry, we got a field of view, and... This one? <laughs> right, so, uh, maybe we should just go over the yeah, demo. Um, Yes. So what we basically have here, some of the features that a user can either generate rain for the scene. We have our own Perlin voice um, function implemented for 4D. We also added a, um, a Stephen Cameron. It's Open Simplex in C. It's got an implementation of the Open Simplex algorithm. And uh, this is what the visualizer looks like when you load it. This is a pre Defined scene. We actually have a way users can specify their own scene format. It's just a listing of um, coordinates. What's happening here is the center coordinate of every tesseract is sent to the GPU, where it generates the actual mesh data. That's sent back as a uh, series of triangles to rasterize. We can also toggle a wireframe mode, just for uh, help debugging. So this this is actually um, a two by two by two by two cube. It extends in the 4D. So as we start to rotate, you can see it distort. If we switch back to the solid view, what we're actually seeing now is the envelope of that 4D shape as projected in the 3D, which is why it looks uh, distorted. So you can actually um, change the way this looks quite a bit. Colors in our demo are how we indicate how far something is in the W direction. And as you translate too far, you'll see parts of it start to disappear. And what's happening here is obviously they're they're getting clipped as you move away. They no longer exist in this space exactly. And with this, we were able to explore some interesting properties of actually being able to move okay. forward. I'll we'll bring up the wall demo. So this, this is how we'll demonstrate collisions. This is a, uh, an example of a wall, but what's actually, it's co-located with another 4D wall that has a hole cut in it. As we bump into it, the camera's colliding. But if we translate a bit, we can move through it because it's no longer yeah, we're, we're, we're actually showing a piece of geometry, which has a hole. If you rotate, there you go. You can see 
You rotate so they're separate. This is what the scene actually looks like. The second wall has a cutout in the middle that you can pass through. Once. If you want to show the um, simplex. So this is an example of uh, you know, some of our randomly generated noise. It looks kind of messy, but that's just because it's it's all stacked. What we would think as 3D noise is actually we're, we're seeing a lot of the projections playing on top of each other. As you rotate, you can get some really uh, distorted views of the scene. You want to back at it a little bit? Yeah. Um, in terms of performance, there's now there you can see some of the um, noise holes opening up in the middle as we shifted. Some layers fell out. But uh, in terms of performance, the real killer for us was actually baking these um, meshes. We used Anvil, the AMB's implementation of uh, a Vulcan wrapper. So that, that was the step that took the longest amount of time. Actually rendering this is pretty fast, even though we're currently storing all the in faces that are um, you know, drawn across that fourth dimension. And this is just so you can see, as we increase the number of meshes, what happens to our baking time. That's just kind of what limits the size of what you can actually show. The way we would work around this is obviously do something like chunking, where you can batch multiple meshes into one larger, uh, larger triangle. Okay. Uh, that's questions. about it. Any questions? Hi everyone, uh, we're Maurice Senior Draksha. Our project is a uh, digital train generation. So the main goal for our project was implementing these three pipelines in order to render tessellation heavy and procedurally generated train. So we have like the traditional four pipeline does everything in one number pass, the preferred pipeline, which has two passes, the first pass sends partial G buffer data to the second uh, stage where um, shading actually happens. We also have the visibility pipeline. Which is proposed by this JCGT paper by Barnes and Hunt. Um, essentially, it's the preferred pipeline, but with a reduced G. Also, the JCGT paper does not provide any implementation for uh, uh, for the visibility pipeline using uh, tessellation heavy geometry. So we kind of invented our own way of doing the tessellation uh, visibility pipeline. Uh, what we do essentially is store the XC values and the UV values, and those values are then passed to the preferred or the visibility uh, second render pass. Uh, to reproduce the normal, to generate shadows, to shading, and texture. Uh, the first feature that we're going to talk about is dynamic level of detail. Essentially, our train is a grid of offsets, and uh, for all of these offsets, they're represented by a cell uh, with edges. And for each of these edges, we calculate the distance from the camera. And for uh, with this distance and the width of the edge, we generate a level of detail for that edge. This kind of enforces uh, a kind of continuity in our train. And one important point to note is that uh, this, this feature is a gives a significant performance boost to all of our pipelines. We have simple texture mapping as well. Um, you can see on the image on the left what the UV mapping sort of looks like in the crosshairs. But it is enough to let, our, let us color our chunk. Uh, for shadows, we remarch uh, along towards the light from a given point in the train. And for every single point on the ray, we sample the noise to get the height of the train at that point. If the height of the train is higher than the point's uh, height, then the point is in shadow. And uh, the important, other important point to note is that this is a significant bottleneck for our pipeline. Uh, we have a sky box as a movie So, yeah. Um, essentially, we, for each screen, screen space fragment, we can find out the director from that to the camera. And using this direction, you can sample skybox texture and figure out the first shading sun, which is defined by a sun direction. Uh, height based fox is, is a parametric equation, generates a value between 0 and 1 based on the height of the fragment and the distance, and generates the fog as dust. So, for the demo, we have a video that uh, kind of shows the sun coming from the left uh, over here. And the sun kind of shades the train, it's more pronounced in the background over here. And 
you can see that the shadows are moving along with the light that is provided by the sun. Uh, it becomes more effective as the, as the sun goes behind us and the shadows uh, become like start to move away because of the train behind us. So, so we'll get performance analysis. So when we have none of the features we talked about enabled, you can see actually the further and forward have similar performance. It's faster. We think this is because of the um, well, visibility pipeline has a smaller G buffer and that just because of the memory bandwidth requirements makes it run faster than the pipeline. Um, as soon as we turn on shadows, the, uh, the performance tanks. Uh, but the deport, deport and the visibility pipeline then kind of shine because because we're only shading for the fragments that are visible and the forward kind of lags behind. And visibility is still faster than both the pipelines because it has a lower overhead of uh, memory and the architecture reads. And then when we enable all features, uh, we also enable dynamic LOD, which is why um, you can see, if you go back to the other slide, you can see the performance is a bit better. Yeah, so when we have all features, it is better because of that dynamic uh, LOD. For shortcomings, one of the things that we could work on is uh, the transparency. It requires a significant overhead of the uh, overhaul of the code uh, for, for implementing the transparency right now for the uh, visibility and the decor pipeline, but it's possible to also, ray marking shadows, it's, it's a very slow process. We can optimize them using uh, textures with baked uh, noise values instead of generating the noise value at every single point. Um, also, there's a quick uh, real time running project right now. Um, hey, I'm Ricky. I'm Wen Li. And we implemented realistic real time rendering of ocean waves in GL. Um, so, a quick project overview and of the pipeline as well. Um, first, we started to construct the entire mesh with uh, patch construction, which basically split up the entire mesh into nine separate parts, which allowed us to optimally render out an expansive ocean um, and expansive ocean with view dependent geometry. And then in the vertex shader, we were able to use fast Fourier trans transformations to create a height map. And after that, we were able to do a lighting model with reflection, refraction, Fresnel, and alpha blending. So our ocean wave height map is based off of a paper by Tessendorf. So just two examples of simulating height maps. So uh, this is like a low frequency and this is a high frequency. And basically, we just place the mesh that we construct uh, for each vertex by like this type map. And so this is a full debug view we had. Uh, so we're tweaking a lot of parameters to make the ocean look realistic and the wireframe just gives you a really good view of the height of the actual species. We'll talk a lot more about this during our demo. So this is our live demo of the ocean waves. Right now, this is a resolution of 512, and we have different parameters that you can adjust. After two, we can level in detail. Um, and the speed just like how fast we go. We're also able to add terrain and. For the level of detail, we can check out the wireframe. So we also try implementing choppiness. As you can see, the large waves are very smooth. The choppiness basically adds another dimension to the wave displacement. So the vertices mm -hmm. are also displaced along the x-axis in addition to the y. 
Um, so if you can see that these like vertices are like going back and forth in addition to going up and down, but this didn't quite get the effects that we wanted to for the large waves. So the idea was that we would sample waves at a lower resolution to get a large wave frequency. And I chopping this there, but we ended up just uh, implementing our own uh, like own wave height map using like our knowledge of sinusoids. Um, and for performance analysis, going back to the geometry, this is one of the first optimizations we added. Um, and basically the uh, general overview is this, that in the middle of our mesh is where we have the highest resolution, so 512. Then as we go farther away from the middle, which is usually where the user stays, um, the resolution goes down to like 28. As you can see, the, there's a significant performance gain from that, um, but not as much as the resolution. So our next attempt at our optimization was moving some of our perf, uh, pre process moving some of our computing steps to the pre-processing stage. And we were computing Phillips spectrum on the GPU, which took a lot of like uh, calculations. And since it only needed to be computed once per vertex, we thought we would move it to the CPU. And it turns out that ended up being slower. And so we looked into our code a bit and we realized we were accidentally creating our buffers incorrectly. Um, so if we were accidentally loading data to our buffer every frame before, like, before we did our analysis. And so after optimizing the buffers, we got uh, our frame rate up to 60 FPS for resolution up to and including. And so just to cover some shortcomings of our project, one thing that we were changing, as one mentioned before, was the large wave height map, um, as well as we decided to focus more on how the ocean waves were going to be rendered and the specific details rather than the aesthetics. So the live stream has been going between uh, 30 and 49 viewers. It is pretty good. Power. Power. It will not work without it. Uh, it'll actually work okay. Flash power is good. It's a lot of Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. I'm Dan. I'm Joe. And we have made Project Marshmallow, and we want to start our live demo. All right. So, clouds in Vulkan. 60 FPS, 1080p, fully procedural, fully animated. For the motion blur, of course. God rays. And terrain. Terrain's pretty simple, though. All right, so we have a lot to cover. Hopefully, we can get to most of it in uh, these few minutes we have. Start? Yeah, so as you heard before, we also implemented the paper called Anubis in the 2015-2017 uh, State Graph Papers. Um, so, this is the dream. You just saw the dream is real. And so, let's go over our review of the project. Uh, so, our goal was to do everything procedurally. Um, we wanted it to be art directable, so there's fairly heavy reliance on 2D and 3D textures to determine cloud placement and shape. Um, and we're ray marching it because that gives us the most control over the cloud shape, all that. The um, thing is, ray marching is expensive, so we used a technique called reprojection to keep our FPS high. Um, and we also didn't want our clouds to be solely a static background, so we also implemented uh, shadow casting on our terrain to make it a little more dynamic. And <coughs> max quality, max settings, of course. All right. So this math is the basis behind almost all of our cloud shape and a whole bunch of other things in the, uh, in the program. So this is what we call remap. And it basically takes some value x, and as long as it's between a, a max and a min that you provide, uh, it puts it to a new relative position between a new min and a new max. 
Uh, so in this case, X is like a low resolution density for a cloud, and uh, the minimum is a high resolution density. And this is kind of what it looks like in a curve. So we can say this orange curve is our low resolution noise, and this green curve is our higher resolution noise, and it's kind of out of phase. And this blue curve is what happens if we remap this with this as the minimum. Uh, and you can see the uh, orange curve on top of the blue curve. Uh, it preserves these high density area and gives us these uh, really nice kind of eroded edges on all of our clouds. Wow, okay. <laughs> So to do this, we have to ray march at multiple resolutions. From the inner atmosphere to the outer atmosphere, we step along and we sample this low resolution cloud. If we hit the low resolution cloud, we switch to a much smaller step size, sample our high resolution cloud instead. Until we keep missing it, then we go back to low resolution. Uh, and while we are stepping inside the high resolution cloud, uh, we take a bunch of samples of the cloud in a cone oriented towards the direction of the sun. Okay, so let's talk optimization. Uh, as I said before, we're going to use a technique called uh, rate projection. So, uh, first of all, we only update one every 16 pixels. As you can imagine, it's going to look kind of ridiculous if we didn't do anything with the other six, uh, 15 pixels. So, anything that isn't getting updated this frame is going to be reprojected, and we're going to use information from the previous frame buffer to update this frame. So, let's say we're looking at our cloud, camera moves. We're going to reuse uh, information from the previously computed frame buffer into our new frame buffer. So how do you do that? Yeah. Um, and by the way, you end up with literal edge cases when uh, reprojected rays uh, try to look outside the previous frame buffer. Yeah, So, one minute, okay. So here are the two frames from the previous slides. You can see the border of the old frame is in red. Uh, when we move the camera up and to the left, that border is now here. So all of this stuff is able to safely reproject, but this stuff, we kind of have to invent what goes there. Uh, we can do a cloud. Right now, we're literally just clamping it to an edge, which creates a horrible smearing. Uh, but the uh, that's completely blocked out by the motion blur, and it still looks pretty good. So the actual math, real quick. Take your intersection point with the atmosphere, which is a giant sphere. Um, put that into the previous frame's camera view space. Uh, normalize that. That gives us a ray direction. Then you can apply inverse ray casting math to give us an actual UV, and you can just read from your text like that. Okay. Uh, yeah, so we also have shadow casting that goes on top of the mesh. Uh, it's almost exactly the same, except it's a much lower resolution. We never sample high, de high resolution density, and uh, it requires a bit more tweaking, but it's a pretty good approximation right now. Okay, real quick render pipeline overview. We are all in HDR. So first of all, we run a compute shader on every pixel in our image that reprojects uh, and applies motion blur. Then we uh, run our uh, ray marcher on the uh, one every 16 pixel that we want. Uh, put it on the screen, God Ray, Radio Blur, um, put our mesh in the scene with shadows, and try to do tone mapping, put it on the screen, that's it. Uh, the gist of it, 60 FPS at 1080p on my laptop, which uses a NVIDIA GTX uh, 970M. Uh, that is the average of the worst case, which is looking with clouds occupying the whole screen, kind of towards the horizon, where the march is the longest, because we go from one atmosphere shell to another. Uh, reprojection is what makes it possible. Uh, if we did one quarter instead of one sixteenth, it ran at about 40 at 720p, as opposed to 60 at 1080p. Um, and of course, the FPS goes way higher depending on where you look, because rays can also be pulled by direction, uh, like below the horizon. Um, also, looking straight up, the march is shorter because of where we are in relation to the atmosphere. Uh, future work. Uh, terrain is really boring right now. Uh, uh, high reliance on magic numbers uh, was discussed as a shortcoming of this work. It's extremely hard to calibrate and tweak. We think we've gotten it to a pretty good place, though. Uh, better cloud coloring. Our transmittance and irradiance are very good. Uh, I think they fake a lot of the colors in the game itself, so we can add that. Uh, reprojection artifacts, we've managed it fairly well, but we could also overdraw it. Um, and right now it's not a deferred pipeline. Uh, we showed the pipeline earlier. And we have a strange bug where the performance like falls off like a literal cliff after three minutes, and we can't figure out why. So until then, it's 60 FPS, so we would just, I guess, refresh it in a case situation. And that's it. Questions? So the parameters that we're tuning are mostly how we transform our point in world space to sample the maps. 
Um, so with our weather, our weather coverage texture is a 2D texture that tiles and determines like how, I guess, inflated the cloud shape is and how big it scales like along the atmosphere. So is it like a, is it kind of wispier? Is it like a giant cumulus cloud? Um, you don't want the tiling to be too evident. Uh, and all of these textures kind of have to be out of phase. Otherwise, um, this map here will not look as good, right? So you can tell that this repetition is different from this repetition. So now we get a bunch of different shapes on the uh, erosion. Also, I think when it comes to high density, I'm sorry, high resolution maps, um, if you tweak that, I think it'd be reasonable to expect that it has a fairly drastic effect on the shape. But if you want to say, make it be a rainy scene, okay? so like bump up cloud coverage, stuff like that. Uh, Reading from a texture like that is actually pretty intuitive to change, and it responds kind of how you'd expect. So, yeah. All right, general results. Cool. And then just to, to both teams doing the cloud rendering, uh, in season of this spring, we are adding cloud rendering contributions. Welcome. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so our project is uh, what we call the Pollux Render. It's a Monte Carlo path tracer written um, in metal for uh, Apple's GPU specification uh, language. We think it's the first metal path tracer written ever, but we are being safe with that, so we're just going to say it's probably the first metal path tracer written ever. Okay. Definitely the first attempt. Definitely. So let's start off with a quick, simple demo of a very simple scene that you've all seen hundreds of times. Very quick. No, no, you gotta exit this. Yeah. So, basic Kernel box. We've seen this before, but it's a quick demo of what Metal can do. Also, move around. Basic camera controls. Not too dissimilar from what we did before in CUDA, except now it's been moved into Metal. Compatible with Mac OS and iOS. We'll get to that. So a little bit about Metal as a um, language. It's the uh, GPU interface language for the Mac OS system and iOS system. And so um, the benefits of it are that it provides a lot of the same functionality that we saw with CUDA, where you can launch kernels and you have control over threads, block sizes. Um, you can leverage uh, the memory structure in to, to speed up your performance. Um, but it, it does have a couple other attributes that um, differentiate it from the other explicit graphic APIs. So, for instance, it's, uh, it's lower level than CUDA. It's not quite as verbose as Vulkan, but it does require you to set up your pipelines explicitly, um, and so it gives you a little bit more control in that way. Um, the memory structure for iOS and macOS has... We're going to skip that then. <laughs> cool. So, features... Here, are just like a, a grab bag of the features that we did. Some of the really cool ones um, are the fact that it works on iOS and macOS. Um, the subsurface scattering that we did, we added a lot of the cool things we did in the CUDA path tracer. Yusuf 
Um, so basically, um, we basically build a lot of frameworks for Metal that have never been done before, at least as far as we could find. Uh, these are all open source. We have a random number generator, stream compaction that may or may not be faster than NVIDIA's. We haven't really done the performance analysis uh, hardcore. Array partitioning, uh, a KD tree uh, that's compacted using a really cool algorithm thanks to Mariano somewhere, uh, used with permission, multiple port sampling, and yeah, pretty much it, filming to a mapping. Yeah. All right, so we're going to show you a little bit of our progress throughout the, the four weeks. All right, so this is where we were on milestone one. This is just basic camera rays uh, used as colors, the direction used as colors. Milestone two, a bunch of debug views, a little bit of pain. Um, awesome. We got it working on iOS, uh, and we had a couple of cool VRDFs, and oh. you want to show the live camera? Yeah. So basically, this is what we have on Mac. Uh, if okay, cool. Here it is running live. Pretty cool, with some depth of field for good measure. And, oh. right, we're so, going to try and show you a... Here's just a quick overview of the frameworks again. Array partitioning weeks also extended the sim, uh, Swift SIMD linear algebra library, random number generator, screen compaction, and, okay, so basically these are references. We used a lot of references. Uh, most of them were pretty basic, so we had to develop over them. That's pretty much it. Future improvements. Uh, for the future improvements, we want to do this KD traversal to be stackless on the GPU. Uh, the way to do it needs a little bit of refactoring of the code, but it seems fairly easy. Uh, we want to do the KD construction on the GPU because it's fairly slow right now. Yeah. Um, we wanted to de-add and denoising filters. Metal has a tile-based deferred rendering pipeline that you can leverage that would be really interesting to go into. Um, AR kit integration would be really cool with iOS, but we didn't quite get to that. All right now, Yus is going to show you a really cool demo um, that we're going to put on the screen, a live demo from his phone, and... The world bar the pass this around. Okay, interactive. This AR? That's not AR. That's just the path tracer running with a couple of the features that we had. But it's not as going to be as impressive as that. But you can look at that. This is my phone. All right. It takes a while to load because it's a very heavy app. But when it loads, this is what we have. This is running live on my phone. This is um, a Mar the Mars God. And it's we couldn't <coughs> find Pollux. Yeah. Just grab the colors. Okay. Uh, this is seventy thousand polygons. It's a, a refractive transmissive material uh, with in a scene. The the scene is almost a thousand polygons too. And the KD tree sums up to about like fifty thousand. Uh, sorry, two hundred thousand something like that uh, from the fifty original fifty thousand seventy thousand polygons. And Pretty much it, since we're out of time. That's it. Questions? I think I both you around very nice. The other thing I want you to have done is you kind of showed week by week progression. That was as quickly as you And then you start encouraging everyone to do that in the future. Thank you. Right. Thank you. My computer is just really bad with <laughs> battery, so... It's not that when you're just running a demo. Yeah, no, we're showing a video. <laughs> okay. Hey, everyone. I'm Mohammed. This is Mariana. Hey.
Um, and we're going to talk to you guys about um, our project, Organic Mesh Growth. So essentially the idea of the project is to use SDFs, or rather SDF representations of meshes, and um, deform the mesh using convolution kernels and various like vector fields. So in case you guys don't know, SDFs are signed distance fields, which you can kind of think of as like a 3D grid at which any cell within that grid represents the distance to a surface of your mesh. So if you're outside, it's positive on the surface, approximately zero, and inside, negative. Most of these kind of like simulations usually use SCFs for then remeshing and then going back to SCF and remeshing so that they actually use triangles, but use the SCFs as a way to move, uh, to drive displacement on the triangles. Uh, our objective was essentially working with just with SCFs. So just an overview of our pipeline. We use Vulkan to uh, achieve this. Right now, what we have is essentially at first, we create the SDF and any like noise textures that we might be using to drive our simulation. SDF deformation also happens in the compute shader, so these two are use compute pipelines within Vulkan. And then you have this kind of simulation loop where we ray march the SDF to visualize, then deform every frame. So one of the big parts of this project was formalizing what it means to deform an SDF, and we kind of narrowed it down to two types of deformation, kernel displacements and vector field displacements. So here's just like a brief list. Like we have relaxation as a form of kernel displacement and expansion, gravity, repulsion, curvature-based, noise, and planar expansion for uh, the kinds of vector field displacement. And we'll show some examples now of how those look. A lot of these were reverse, reverse engineered from our references. Essentially, the paper that we were implementing didn't have a lot of uh, explanations on how they, they actually did it. Uh, so we had to basically try to find a way through these uh, kernels and vector displacements in SCF space uh, to get kind of like the same uh, experience. So here we have the Sanford Dragon uh, growing when there is more curvature. So essentially every, every small feature gets emphasized. Here we have a melting, uh, no, sorry, it's, uh, <laughs> the demon one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's essentially growing uh, based on a curl noise and then also using repulsion and curvature and like you see, like it deforms in, in weird uh, ways. We thought this mesh would be interesting to use because the bus had a lot of curly hair, so that curvature really is brought out um, with a lot of our um, displacements. Yeah. Uh, one of the most interesting one is a planar expansion. Uh, essentially, it forces stuff to grow on the plane of the perpendicular to, to a specific normal. And it kind of looks like like a mushroom growth. So we basically gave a small mushroom mesh and tried to, to make it grow. Um, the results are interesting, but it's really unstable. It's really hard to like manage and get something interesting. Um. <laughs> uh, also, the shading is uh, completely done on the ray marcher uh, through uh, like ray marching trees. And this last one is melting. We essentially use uh, some kind of like gravity displacement with uh, relaxation, which is running over every displacement actually. Uh, the relaxation makes like the melting kind of like grow in space and the gravity makes it fall. Um, we also have some uh, whirly noise that it's added on the, on the mesh. So on certain uh, places of the mesh, there's more gravity or less gravity, uh, which make like this weird shape. So. Uh, just a quick performance analysis talk. Um, of course, since we're using SDFs, there's like stuff to be spoken about with the resolution of our SDF. Um, so we decided that 256 is kind of the best. We get like real-time rates by doing the, these simulations. But as you can see, like as we increase the resolution, so we're talking 256 cubed is real-time. We reach five, um, 512 cubed, and it kind of like really shoots up, and anything past that is completely unreasonable. Um, so 256 was just a good happy medium for us. Uh, 512 is real time, it runs at around 20 to uh, 30 frames. But interactive rates. It's interactive, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and since we're doing uh, convolution kernels, there's always something, you know, you can always uh, use shared memory in order to speed up like memory access because you're essentially referring to these same bits of memory like over and over again, so why not put it in faster memory? Um, so you do get a benefit by putting it in shared memory, but not really large enough for us to increase the half the kernel half width. So we got minor improvements from it, but nothing that's too usable as of the resolution cur like currently. Yeah. Also for the actual mesh SCF generation, 
turns out it's not trivial. <laughs> um, so we like essentially, if you just implement a naive uh, triangle mesh uh, to SCF uh, conversion, it takes a lot of time. Um, and considering that we were initially using 512 and then 256, uh, it took like it essentially made Windows kill the application because of the TDR. Um, so we had to implement a Kitty tree, and we had to make a, a like a bunch of optimizations so that the so that the SCF took around like 10 seconds. Uh, we also like trying to find the sine distance function of a, of a sine distance field of a triangle is hard because uh, triangle orientations um, are not trivial to to transform into SCF. Um, but essentially, yeah, like we got it to run to in, like in reasonable interactive rates, like you can wait for 10 seconds and you have a uh, very big uh, SCF lecture. Yeah, all done. Uh, all so done. if you guys have any questions. Yeah. OMG is organic mesh growth. Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, All right. It's what? Oh, it's not physical. It's not physical, but yeah. we can implement kernels that actually, like, the, the data is there. <laughs> yeah, a lot of the examples you saw were, like, kind of combinations of those um, kinds of displacements we talked about. Um, and it's very like artistically driven. Um, so you have parameters to play with, and yeah, our objective is with this like making a kind of like an artist-oriented tool, so that you can basically grow stuff on meshes and use that uh, yeah. like use the result for something interesting. Yeah, like a small but expressive um, yeah. parameter set. Yeah. It's not like a fluid solver. Other questions? Are there other questions on the live OMG or other stuff. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. So, hello everyone, I'm Mohamed, and my project is Particle Discharge, and basically what I aim to do, what I aim to do with this project was simulate uh, electrostatic discharge between two objects when they're close to each other. So just give you an overview of the of the of what I was what I wanted to what I wanted to get with this project. So basically I have a 3D grid of balls moving around in the scene. And with different uh, triangle velocities, of course, and that's basically what I do is I check the neighbors. Uh, check each ball's neighbors, and if they're close enough, I would discharge an electric static charge. Oh, yeah, sorry. Discharge, like, charge, discharge between the uh, balls. So everything in the scene is implemented using a particle simulation, basically. So the ball basically is a comprised of set of particles, and uh, and using these particles, when when it's close to another ball, they get discharged. And it creates the the bulk basically, and so uh, because of that, the number of particles limit the number of neighbors uh, a ball can interact with. So, for example, let's say uh, this ball was close to other five balls. I would, if if I if I don't have enough particles, it would only interact with four neighboring with, with only four and not the fifth one. Uh, uh, how do they? So, for the bulk to, to convert it to particles, basically, I. I shaped it using a combination of triangle waves, sine waves, and cosine waves. And I use 100 particles exactly. I mean, that could be changed, but I just found 100 to be a good, a good number. And to align the particles first along a line, I pre index them during rationalization. And basically, using those waves, I can offset it to give that look. And then I, can, and, and then I randomize it with a different bunch of brown fields. So, because I'm using, yeah, so the part of is on WebGL too. And because it's on WebGL, I, there's no compute changes. So to deal with, to be able to find to, to find the neighbors of the ball, I had to store that into sectors. So for each cell in the grid, for each one of these blocks, 
I basically store the number of balls within it and the ball indices into a texture. And also for each ball, I store its attributes and such, such as position, color, and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, uh, for performance analysis, so what I mean by physics enabled and physics disabled is so instead of just um, like, so for the particles, uh, initially what I used to do is just I set its position to what I want it to be without any like velocity or mass or anything to the, part, to the particle itself. So with physics enabled, it's a little bit slower, but uh, it should be much faster with physics disabled, but because I was using the same shader, which was a mistake, obviously, it, it's, the, the difference is not that huge. The other thing I did is I have to limit the maximum number of neighbors per, per ball to improve the performance. So initially what I would do is I would have like, I would assign a, a huge number of particles for each ball, and, but that had a huge performance hit. So what I did is I just limited and it improves performance. So now the live demo. Yep. So this is what I have right now. So, um, yep. So this is what I was saying about yeah the side waves, cosine waves, and angle waves. It gives it a good look, and also, so what I tried to add here was particle physics, just to animate it a little bit. And then added current, randomizing the current. So then I can increase the number of balls. So this is with 400. I had a lot of problems with uh, getting the particles to move as fast as, it, as they should to make it simulate, mimic the effect of electrocardic discharge. But yeah, this is also the thing that. Yes. Yep, that's what it is. Oh, you can't. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, hello guys. Um, we're going to do a presentation about our project, Autonomous Driving with Deep Learning. So uh, these are the group members, Zui, Qin, and Yang. So actually, um, here's a, what we have done. Uh, we, ha we did a project about simulation of autonomous driving system controlled by GPU accelerated neural network with multiple features. So what we have did on milestone one, we, 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 the control system is implemented using fit forward neural network. NPID controller. In milestone two, we implement a lane, keep, lane keeping in point cloud. In milestone three, we use pylon net to use the neural, system, neural network to learn uh, how people would drive the car. And this, the new the, the milestone four, we did the distributed system in SegNet. So my friend will introduce the first part. Okay, so uh, because our, sy our system now contains two CN and and let, 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 let me answer one of, one of the questions last time. Our neural network, because, because it contains so many arguments, so many weights, so we have to use GPU to compute it. So all of, all of these are done on the GPU. So now because the work is so heavy, we have to separate them all. Next page. Yes, here we recorded in, 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 his, in his room. We have three computers. Now we connect each other using the Wi-Fi and yeah, this is my computer. This is a silent. So I I will send pictures, image data to them. Hey, hey. Yes. And this is Lisa use computer. It, it will it will do the uh sec sec net and the uh Net. And here is, is his computer. On this, on this computer, we, we, also, we also do the depth image, and we, we will send the, all this back, and you will see it on here. Okay, so what, why we use this is using only one computer, if, if it can hold it, we only got seven frames per second, and using two, we got 25. That's enough, but not good enough. So using three computers, now we, 
we reach amount of 61, that is almost the maximum of the line. Okay. So before going strictly to the segment which we implement for uh, semantic segmentation, I want to talk a little bit more about DCNN, the Deep Evolutionary Neural Network. So we actually, we uh, so it's referenced from the three papers. One of the from Stanford University talks about the concept, and we our um, structure is strongly based on the paper of um, UC Berkeley. It's called a fully convolutional neural network for semantic segmentation. So. So first about it. Uh, so what we have changed from the fo former convolutional neural network is we replaced the fully connected layers at the end by the convolutional layers with very large receptive fields. And we keep the input and output dimension same. And so for the GPU parts in the structure, so all the operations in the FCN use, in use CUDA GPU, which contains convolutional operation, uh, down, uh, down sampling and up sampling, and also activation functions. Actually, SoftMax also uses GPU. So the structure is like this. Um, we force, we down, for we do down, down pulling and back, back up pull, so, and then we do up pulling to keep the same dimension. And during that, we use the encoder and decoder architecture to faster the process. So yeah, if you guys are uh, confused about the structure or the concept, you can look up for the paper for new, for more information. And here comes the standard segmentation we implemented. So we use SegNet, SegNet 8 actually. It's a simplified version of SegNet. Um, we use that structure uh, to implement our, to, so here is that kind of the result we have. Um, so on the left side, you can, you can see it relatively accurate. So you can recognize the car, the road, and the buildings around it. And here's the final result. We, come, we put all the systems, control system together. Here, as I said, lane keeping and car detection. It, it drives safely using the lane keeping and it could detect the car on the road. And we also have the segmentation and depth so it could know how far it's, it is uh, from the obstacles on the road. So it could drive more safe than before. Here's a small, a small demo we have. Yeah, it's the last demo here. So before we only used pilot, pilot net to control. Then it could, yeah, it could recognize some obstacles, but it doesn't know like how far it is or it, what kind of obstacle is there. So it will stop in front of like little grass like that. If it, it found something weird in the front, it was just stop. But if we can combine that with the segmentation and all the depth, depth map we have, so it could know it's safe on driving on that, but it's not safe on the left, so it could be so it could cast that kind of path. And here's the performance analysis. We compare our um, speed with we implement that or use shared memories, we compare that with, uh, with a version before which we didn't use that. It's kind of faster. Also, we test, uh, test, our, uh, uh, test our system on our friend's um, computer, which has tensor core. It's much more faster than the CUDA core. Then we made this uh, data analysis. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, we are one of the WJS team, and I'm having as this session. Uh, so first, uh, our project is about post-processing and uh, our weather system in WJS. So since creation, we got a very nice project cover from, uh, to represent the different stages of weather in our demo scene. Uh, yeah. So first, an overview. So uh, first of all, WJS is a sort of powerful uh, WebGL engine and uh, very easy to use and uh, has a lot of functions we need um, during develop. So like, what our, our contribution is mainly about like, we extend the uh, post-processing library, a tons of post-processing effects, uh, mainly a uh, sterilized cartoon post-processing and uh, crystallization and ring and forest post-processing. And uh, we also 
uh, extend a material library. Uh, we create some uh, materials needed in our wet weather scenes, uh, including snow and the raining material. And we also create a, a new sky material to uh, give a more realistic uh, feeling of the scene. Uh, so. so in terms of technical approach, uh, first of all, post-processing is relatively uh, relatively simple, like we basically do two things. First, we either like uh, create a new pixel color based on surrounding pixels or kernels. And uh, the second is that we create a new effect, uh, uh, like by offsetting the UVs and then composing with our RGB for example, the wind and forest effect. Uh, so in terms of the weather system, we, we use a, a tons of like particle system in WGS and uh, we create some material materials, for example, the rainy ground material and the snow material. Uh, specifically speaking, rain material we the transition between uh, wet ground and the puddles, and we also do real-time reflection of the sky sphere, and we also have some ripple, uh, ripple animations uh, to make it more realistic. And snow material... Uh, so the snow material has two types. One is to make the objects covered with white texture a snow-like texture, and the other one is to accumulate snow to change the original mesh of the objects. And also we need to change the relative environment, since like uh, environment is totally different during different weather systems. Uh, say for example, we, we got a snow scene, so we, we add some scene fog, and like in, the, in a lightning scene, um, you have to change the uh, lightning or the uh, luminescence of the scene very, very quickly. So, and we also added some sound effects and weather related post processing. And the uh, uh, so most, most exciting part of that will be the. Yeah. Just be careful, they are lighting. All right, great. Tons of reading materials, and uh, we also add a gallery and better splash particles. There are dynamic shadows here of this light, street light, and the tree here. So, as I mentioned. Uh, there are two types of materials. One is to cover the surface of the objects by its normal to uh, translate it to the snow texture. The other one is to accumulate, uh, like you can see here and here, like the mesh uh, are growing as the time goes on. So finally, is the day and night cycle. So the original sky material of the Babylon is very good. We just add a night scene, which is uh, just changing some parameters of the original one and make the moon position to be the upside of the sun position. Also, we have uh, some burning noise cloud and stars background. Here we also connect the lighting part of the change of sky material. And yeah, in terms of phone analysis, like basically our two demo scenes are pretty runs pretty well. Uh, basically, see, uh, almost six frames uh, um, from so. But like one thing pretty pretty annoying is that when we add some uh, real time generated clouds from the noise texture, the performance just drops. So we just disable disable that. So this one start coming, and uh, we need to optimize in the future. So yeah, and yeah, lastly. From the very beginning, post process, a tone scale. <laughs> yes, thank you. Any questions? Yes. Great job with the video. Uh, has your phone class been noticed? Not yet, but like very soon. Very soon. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. Great job. Hi everyone, I'm Yala and this is Zhao. Uh, our project is also about the Babylon JS. And uh, the Babylon JS is a complete JavaScript framework for building 3D games on web platform. 
and all going to and more useful features to the WNJS. And to do this, we um, tend to tackle the issues on the GitHub repository uh, of this engine. And uh, now we have finished two features. And the first one is the light texture projection. Uh, we added the spotlight projective texture and support for more kinds of lights projection. And the second feature is the optimized particle system. We added more emitter shapes. And the first feature is the light texture projection. We treat the light as the projector and transit from the word space to texture space. And this process is very similar um, to transforming to the camera screen space. Well, and for this part, uh, we actually made some kind of bugs during our development. Then we find out some kind of like the difference between WebGL and WebGL 2.0. Then we add the features of that. We, now we can support for both platforms. Like no matter what kind of the WebGL you are using on your browser, you can, you can simply use our feature. And now and our code has finished most of part of the communication with the author that uh, and build the WNJS, and this feature will be available in future release, in maybe future three, two or three re release, this will be coming very soon. And this is the result, and originally the, spot, the spotlight can only project a few, uh, few color like the yellow, white or something, but now we add the texture now, and we can see more detail for in the live demo photo. And the second feature is the optimized particle system. Uh, in the original particle system, it only supports the bounding box based emitter and the particle um, emits in purely random directions. And uh, now we have optimized the particle system. Now we have two uh, working on, we have now uh, two cone, uh, emit, uh, different kinds of emitters. At first is a cone shaped emitter, and the second is a sphere shaped emitter. And for the, those emitters, they are all related to two kinds of things. For a, for a specific shape of the emitter, it uh, relies on the position that the particles spawn and the direction that the particles goes from. And, we, uh, and in the Fabian JS, it relates to the two function pointer that uh, is, is defined in the classes. And we modify it and, and added more, and uh, added, added our features and added more attributes that we can give it more control. And here's the live demo. <laughs> the first is the emitter. And like here is the emitter that we have modified that pre. And we can change the emitter type very, very simply. And later, uh, we are still working on that. And we for later release, we can uh, re use the defined words instead of the true value of it. And if we change the type from two to three, which is uh, which is from the origin, the, the it changed from the sphere to the object, and for the light projection, like originally we only have a pure light of color, which is uh, embedded in the fabric system, and with a simple line of code here, like here, if that like the light you that project light texture equal to the standard then the texture definition. And then we have had our texture. And also it can be animated, like here we like here when we have done this uh, live demo. And that's the end of the live demo. And credit. Thanks for the for David and Sebastian who has helped us a lot in during our development and they gave us a lot of suggestions and advice on the during uh, after we finish the first part of light projection, and uh, we have made our code more clear, more user friendly, more developer friendly, and and even we have let a lot of the like the functions or interface for future development for any other kind of light or projection. I think everything is well defined. And Sebastian uh, said the uh, he will maybe he will merge our. Uh, for requesting future two or three release, I hope our feature can help us, uh, can help everyone who is who is willing to use this feature. And thanks for everyone. Questions? So,
Yeah, and I, uh, we have after two Skype, uh, two Skype like communication. I think we have uh, changed everything that is required, and now our code is more like a standard code that like most other FileMaker's computers has uh, followed the rules. Cool. Yeah, that would be very accomplished. Thank wow. you. Okay, hello everyone, I'm Jigo Yen, and this is my final project, GPU-based global drone localization. Firstly, I will show um, a flying test video, uh, which I generated last night, and also briefly talk about method I'm using, uh, also the performance analysis, if I, time, if I have time, we'll talk about the further work. So, firstly, uh, the left side, the drone is automatic flying with a circle trajectory. The trajectory is generated uh, manually, but the order controlling localization is done by the, our system. And the right side is uh, visual, uh, lab visualization, uh, which uh, I can monitor. Uh, how is it? Okay. And also, since the important part is the feature instruction and the tracking, uh, for, uh, for the same feature, and also this is a live video from the onboard camera. The circle is the same feature we extract. The, uh, the green one is the extractor, get, uh, get, a green, uh, get a green one, and the blue one is uh, done by the optical, optical flow tracking. Okay, so the, there are three parts uh, for this system, the first one is the feature, uh, feature extraction and uh, tracking. Uh, more precisely, I'm using the same feature for here. Uh, it's extracted using the CUDA. And also the optical floor tracking. This part is done by CPU every week. And the third part is uh, camera post estimation. Uh, it's a linear method which is called the EPNP method. And also sensor fusion. So because the localization method can only output about uh, 20 frames per second, we need the sensor to interplay the result. Uh, here we use uh, UPL filter. So in terms of the whole system, I do uh, did a, uh, a tricky things here. So uh, from the previous milestone, we know that the CPU instruction already fully utilized the GPU, but but uh, can only achieve 10 to 15 frames per second. So here, uh, what we do is uh, we uh, put the optical flow tracking in the CPU, uh, on the CPU side, uh, which keep reading the latest uh, safety structure result to the tracking. And we can achieve uh, about 20 frames per second for our group. So the performance, firstly, let me talk about the uh, uh, platform I use. So the hardware is uh, media TK1 board, uh, which has 192 CUDA core and uh, four core ARM CPU. Uh, the hardware I'm using a DG1 uh, M100 drone, and uh, onboard I'm using sensor, a Blue Fox global travel camera. In terms of speed, so the localization reads uh, always in count to jump uh, to uh, 20 frames per second. And the delay is about uh, 50 milliseconds, which is okay for the controller. And the sensor fusion, of course, is about 90. Uh, accuracy, I also capture, uh, get some uh, ground truth from the motion capture system. And uh, the localization is about uh, 50 uh, millimeter, and the sensor fusion is about uh, 36. Which is kind of okay for controlling, but it's still. The, the flying trajectory is little. Okay, I think that's uh, also all the things about this project. For the further uh, work, uh, currently the accuracy is still not enough. So, five centimeter error is uh, too large for the controlling. The, the flying is not stable. So, maybe I will do some bug check or try some better feature or do more optimization. 
for that uh, camera process. And also I need to do uh, more analysis. Uh, something I've uh, figured, uh, found is that uh, when the system is running, uh, the, the, I mean, the analysis is not only for GPU, also for CPU, for memory, also for network. So I will do more tests and more customer. So yes, same dashboard for uh, this uh, hardware a video which uh, testing the, the controlling gain and also as a similar activity. Question? Yeah, really nice results. Hi, I'm Dan Wong, I'm Yi Guo, and this is our final project that we're going to Yes, our final project. And what we want to build is a high performance um, real time driver. So, um, there is another result. There are over 600 trees. Um, also, 1K resolution and 50 FPS. It's our new key with an um, vertex animation. Also, um, that will be rendering. We also do a uh, calling algorithm. Slightly Um, and, uh, here's our so uh, most of the algorithm or method are very easy and that um, this is the most most uh, the hardest thing to think we um, so, so and, and we want to focus on what we done last week. And last week we uh, finished the density and said, oh, and uh, And the density model function is to uh, generate the big tree of the according to the conditions of the big tree. So it will generate a, a visual effect that um, when you distance from the, the mountain, you will see lots of trees. Close to the real trees, there are only several ones. And uh, here's um, Amount of all work. So you can see when you start from the memory side, the trees will be and other zoning. Here's the data cycle. It's really just blend the uh, box texture and also uh, change the light of color. And um, this shouldn't be very hard, really, but um, the, the, the input is not very friendly to the Vulkan, so um, it takes us a lot of time to this work. So basically, we use two kinds of strategies for the optimization. The first is this is not LOD recording, which means the level of details is depends on the uh, distance between the camera and the trees. And uh, we make a simple, very simple example here. And if, for example, if we set the Z distance of the camera to be 230 and uh, set two, uh, two LOD levels, and uh, for the further trees, they will just, we will just use a billboard to render them. And for the trees that are close to us, we will use the actual models. In this case, we will save around 30% of memories. Uh, of course, the, 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 the percentage here can, can be decided on the 
distance is depend on the depend on the distance between the camera and the tree. And uh, because we uh, using this technique, we need using this technique, we just need to render render less vertex, so the overall render efficiency can be improved. Uh, and uh, the further and the camera get further, uh, it will be rendered very fast. Uh, also, we use the density modification, and uh, here is the comparison result. As you can see, that uh, the left column is the density multiplication, and the right column is low density efficient. Uh, there is no obvious, uh, no obvious virtual difference between these two groups of images, but the rendering speed is, uh, okay. when the camera is very close, uh, the density multiplication will show its benefits, and the link will get further because they both need to render the number of billboards, and they will eventually become the same API scale. So next, we will show our lab demo here. Yeah, really nice job. I can see some of this going into Project 6 <laughs> next year. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, we our project is cesium snow rendering. I did this together with Yao Yibai and Yuxin Hu. And uh, our goal was to take a scene, a normal scene, that's rendered uh, anywhere on the globe, and with a click of a button, make it a snowy scene. So uh, this has great uses because uh, you can um, um, render a scene with various weather conditions. So. Uh, so our approach is based on a real-time rendering of accumulated snow by a group from Uppsala University. And the idea is that um, we, uh, we took a, a blend of a, of a snow material and the background material. And the amount of blend depended on the slope of the, of the, of the uh, terrain. So that, that was modified with a, uh, cos with a, a noise function. And also we added a normal map. Uh, then we uh, made this dynamic by uh, adding snowfall. So here are some of our progress steps. Uh, this is the, the Grand Canyon or the big ditch with no snow. Here we added uh, Perlin noise and uh, there's a normal map as well. Uh, the Perlin noise sort of repeated at a different scale. Here we changed that to a procedural texture with simplex noise and that uh, removed this repeated pattern. Um, and we added a water mask and snow accumulation. The water mask uh, prevents snow from accumulating on the ocean. And we have snowflakes falling on screen space. And the, the direction they are aligned to the gravity direction. And the, the sky can also be turned to gray. And there's very apparent um, screen space fog and ice effect here. Also, we have some adjustable variables like the slope snow falling speed and storm intensity in directions, and the, uh, the users can play, play around with those variables. And since in the real world, there won't be any small snowflakes when it goes above some altitude, and we also implemented this feature in our system. 
So the performance analysis shows that our snow runner reactor slows down the cesium, so we tested both the snow material and snow falling part to check where the bottleneck is. And for the snow material part, the main reason that it slows is because the image-based texture reading for both the normal map and the purling noise. To improve that, we replace the image-based texture with the procedural-based texture so that you can get the noise value from the numerical calculations instead of trying to read several times from the image texture. And similarly, in the snow falling part, it involves a lot of texture sampling to get the alpha value for the snowflake. And so what we do is that we reduce the number of sampling from, 33, from 32 to 16, and we reduce the random path from 3 to 1. Of course, it impacts how detailed you look of your snowflake, but we decided to do this for the sake of performance. And with this little improvement, we managed to bring the performance back from 12 to 20 frames per second, although it's still slower than the original CCM performance, but it's definitely better than our initial implementation. And the shortcoming of our approach is that the snowflake rendering highly depends on the text rate it uses and also the coordinate system. So it requires your camera to be positioned at a relatively fixed position and orientation with respect to the world. And in the system, you can rotate your camera freely however you want. So at a certain angle, you will see there's a swirls in the snowflakes. And also the texture will affect the shape of your snowflake. That's why you will see the, there's a, it's a pixel-like snowflakes on the screen space. But other than that, I think we finished most of what we planned. And now we're going to show you a live demo. Okay, yeah, and welcome to the Grand Canyon. We can let it snow like this. And also compare around with snow. And to make the snow accumulation effect more apparent, we just close the snowflakes and you can see snow is gradually accumulating rain. It's changing based on time. Also, we can go to somewhere beside the sea. And we can also let it snow. And you can see that the snow is gathering on the terrain, but it will not affect the ocean. The ocean is still on the ocean. Finally, if we go all the way up to the sky, there won't be any snow excess if in the real world. But if we just continue to in, the snowflakes would be restored. And I think that's all the demonstration for you. Question? Oh, yeah, really nice job. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Zhong Kai. Uh, so for my final project, I implemented a obstacle detector using FUDA. So the detection is fully based on a pixel wall, which is, um, so the pixel is just columns of pixels in this image. So uh, based on the fact that when you take a picture from the road, the ground is always on the bottom and the sky is always on the top. So using a probabilistic model and dynamic programming, you can uh, find the obstacles um, based on the based on the disparity map, uh, image. So um, this is the result I have. Uh, so the front image is the uh, disparity image, and the bottom one is the result I have. So uh, generally, uh, the pipeline is that first we read an input. Um, of the camera configuration and uh, a few first images and then um, allocate resources, buffers, etc. And then uh, for every uh, input of the image, you compute disparities um, and then process these disparities, uh, compute all the bunch of cost tables and then do the dynamic, dynamic program. And so um, the, main, the main cost of this computation is on the uh, computation of cost tables and the dynamic programming, which uh, has a very uh, high, uh, it's 
the it's it's uh, generally uh, the, the complexity is all to the like n n q. So uh, using uh, GPU, we can uh, improve the improve the performance than using CPU. So last week I uh, implemented naive way and using shared memory. So you, here shared memory is just loading all the data of the cost table into the uh, dynamic programming kernel. So uh, the next step of uh, my uh, improvement is using CUDA streams. So uh, so this was the first uh, implementation of uh, first implementation. You can see that all of these kernels are all uh, the same stream. They are all sequential. And then uh, after my adjustment of this, okay, uh, adjustment, and then you can see they are parallelized. And these are the async memory copy, and these are the kernels. So you can see that um, the performance is uh, way better. And then after this, uh, after this observation, I found that. It's just uh, the time is still too long, so I found there's a, a kind of bug in my code that I use thrust in the device, in the kernel, so it makes the scan become sequential. So I rewrite that into a shared memory, uh, shared memory uh, version, and then the performance is better. And uh, the next step of my uh, improvement is uh, because these uh, pause tables uh, we can actually load them uh, into the dynamic, dynamic programming step, which can, uh, can can make less launch of kernels. So, so this I call it scan on load. So using this method, uh, you can see that there is another five millisecond deficit of improvements. So uh, finally, I use uh, warp shuffle to improve my. Uh, to improve uh, the, 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 the performance. So, uh, because we have a lot of scans in this code, so uh, I use uh, uh, warp shuffle, which uh, specifically is uh, shuffle up uh, to compute the uh, scan. So, you can see that there is another 10 second deficit for this, and the shuffle, because it's just read from registers without shared memory, is way faster. So, uh, this is a uh, whole process of my optimization, and this is a CPU, and this is the final result I got. I got so uh, the performance is uh, like five, five to ten times better. And then uh, this is uh, all the impl implementation before was the pixel width is seven pixels. So this is uh, when we have a thinner pixel, we have more computational amount. So you can see that CPU just surged uh, exponentially, but yeah, uh, GPU is way better. So uh, for the future work, I also tested on the uh, so the previous picture is that uh, the weather is very good without any rain. So this is, has some rain and some reflection on the ground. So you can see that it's not that good um, on this situation. It's just recognize the like the ground reflection as an obstacle. So I think maybe uh, it still needs some work on this situation and. Uh, Finally, is that um, I, I'm tr also trying to scan on load using shuffle, but it seems that the uh, performance is not uh, improved a lot. I, I think it's because when I scan it, um, I need to <coughs> load more shared memory, and so in this step there are potential another bank bank, uh, bank conflicts here. So um, yeah, this might be uh, another future resolutions for this problem. Yeah, uh, that's my uh, final project. Question? Okay, we now have the last presentation of the evening. We actually have 14 people who have stayed with us for two hours on the live stream. Probably only five of them are in the room. I've heard that Jen and Josh have done so much work this year that it may just take go over a very short four minute project projects in one.
So, yeah, I'm Jim. Yeah. <laughs> so we, uh, we have implemented Foxy global elimination and we are pipeline with Qualcomm for our final project. So, first I'd like to um, talk about next year I will get. So, Foxy global elimination means getting joy from Oxidized meshes in the same we are using on tracing. So for the first step, oxidized meshes in the same with conjugated rasterization on the geometry shader. Then um and create a frame risk with using just test fragments from, from the frame shader. Then make a sparse voxel optic structure with the fragment risk and we mean mapping for each other from bottom to top. So these are the random images of our mean map sparse voxel tree. Now with a given mean map sparse voxel tree structure, we can do voxel contrasting at each fragment to get dry colors. So I use six, 60 degrees 7 points for covering our hemisphere for each fragment. Mm. And uh, one, of, one of the advantages is we can get the ambient inclusion from the same voxel testing. This is the, the AU ceiling. And one of the most uh, um, one of the most drawback is you can make some kind of light breathing like this because uh, the, the approximate of contrasting and confusion, you can take their GI colors from the long voxel. For the uh, VR stuff, I'll just do that. I'm fine here. Okay. okay. <laughs> a quick overview of stuff we've done. So, um, first, get something to look like it's being rendered on VR. You need barrel filter um, methods and uh, chromatic aberration methods applied to the screen. Um, you do that, they use a, a brown quantity distortion model. Um, here's an example of that, um, and this is the chromatic aberration. The reason you need this is if you just project a normal 2D screen through like an Oculus VR lens, it's going to get a pin cushion distortion. So you basically need to apply the opposite operation of what's happening physically to the screen, so it comes out. Looking. So for a uh, brown quantity model, there's uh, several ways of getting the um, distortion to happen. One, you can do it all in the fragment shader, so if you're paying the cost of doing that operation per pixel, um, you can do it where you have a pre-made mesh, you distort the mesh in the vertex shader, then for all the pixels that just happen to be in the screen, for, with it, within those triangles, you just run the brown comedy on those pixels, or you can realize that this is all just a fixed operation, pre-calculate all the stuff up front, pre-bake a mesh where you have all the information, sampling information you need, in the vertex attributes and just send that to um, the um, The other thing we did was uh, a radial density masking. Um, it's a technique I think first invented by Val, I'm not sure, but uh, they use it on their render. Basically what you want to do is for the extreme cases outside, like on the far edge of the, the viewing angle, those are rendered at almost 2x times what you actually need because um, those get compressed down in a tiny little band. So uh, on the 2D image, you just render at half resolution, or uh, render only um, half as many pixel, two by two pixel pods as you need. And when you actually distort, the center gets blown out and the edges get uh, scrunched down. So that's an example of that. And then to fill those holes in, um, you can do bilinear um, sampling to fill those holes in. Debug view to make sure I wasn't on myself. 
Um, the other thing we did was uh, <laughs> okay. um, thought of doing an optimization where I wasn't sure if all the barrel sampling uh, was actually needed, so I just made sure um, I was tagging pixels that were actually sampled by the barrel filters to make sure um, all those are basically needed, and it turns out we actually do need all the four pixel pods. That's that image on the bottom is what's being sampled. So basically, I had to abandon that optimization. Um, the other thing we do is to avoid, you basically want to avoid time warping and space warping because it's kind of a little bit nauseating mm -hmm. to the user. So, the better method that they use in Valve is they kind of like interpolate or predict frame, frame rates going up. And you're about to enter a really expensive view, you just turn down the uh, rendering resolution. Um, so that's what I'm trying to show. It's probably really hard to see uh, the different resolutions on that. And then we have time working. Uh, so that's just normal VR. And then I hit a key to stop rendering and just take the last frame, time warp it into where the camera position is. And time. That's what that is showing. So. So, I'm going to show the video. Well over time, but if you want to try the VR. You know. So I would say let's do questions, and I'll do a quick wrap up. About anyone wants to try <laughs> the VR, and this is just to be clear for everyone: this is home grown. You, you can't you can't turn off the VR stuff on Oculus. You kind of just give them a frame. That's what I was trying to. You could give them a frame, but you yeah. get your own filter and all on Oculus. Uh, no, you can't do that. Okay, so it's only the Oculus stuff. It's only the box stuff. Yeah. Nonetheless, still very cool. So, anyway, uh, but before we do that, does anyone have any questions? So, for context here, about you know, I'm always about personal learning. I was about five years ago. I had three very good students in a whole semester in an independent study from Sparse Rocks on Oxford. So, yeah, guys, and one class did a ton of work. Good progress in the field as well. So just a quick wrap up here. So
How many people here are going to take 565 next fall? Just one? Okay. You guys see some others over there? Two? Oh, a bunch! Okay, so you got this is the bar that you have to reach now, right? So, so I do get nervous every year when I'm like, man, the projects are so good. How are we going to top it? But now I come to an event like this, and I'm like, wow, okay, we topped the last semester. But then I have the same problem. Well, geez, what are we going to do next fall? Uh, so we're really going to have to up our game. These projects are overall uh, fantastic. You had people stay with you for two hours in the live stream. I'm sure you will be Twitter famous uh, as well. Uh, please stay in touch with me. Let me know if you need introductions for, uh, for internships or full-time positions. Uh, great job, everyone. And once again, great job to the TAs and Shazam.